Hey everybody, welcome to Casino Lunch number 50. Uh, I know we've been now doing it for a little bit over a year, but we had to skip a couple of uh, weeks for Christmas and New, year, and New Year's and maybe um, Thanksgiving. And I think we've been doing this now for a whole year, but we have to double check. Um, today's topic is Casino Lunch. Um, sorry, it is, it is Casino Lunch. Um, it's machine learning with Spark and Cassandra. We've had a couple of talks on this before. I'm literally interested um, on what Nikita has to say about this. Uh, I really like Nikita's uh, work with the ACA stuff that he did before with, with Cassandra. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm an organizer on this group, uh, Beta, uh, Beta Stacks, Cassandra DC, uh, as well as the Chicago DC. Um, sorry, Chicago Cassandra group. Um, we are looking for co-organizers. Uh, if you're a practitioner, you're looking at this on YouTube and like to present something or you would like to help organize this group, let us know. We're part of a larger uh, group of meetups called Data Community DC, which is a nonprofit foundation that uh, basically you know, believes in building a diverse community of data practitioners from all backgrounds. So as you can see, there's data visualization, data science, a whole stack, statistical seminars. Um, there's a little bit of something for everybody. What do we cover here? We cover the, the Cassandra protocol. Quite honestly, because Cassandra has become a fairly popular protocol for storage and retrieval of information. Uh, I'm talking about you know, CQL as a, as a way to structure data and retrieve it um, across technologies, including Scylla, Gigabyte, Cosmos, uh, managed key spaces for Cassandra, which are not based on the Cassandra code at all, actually. They're just completely different engines, uh, but they use Cassandra protocol. And obviously Cassandra, Datastax, Alessandra. If anybody has a talk to give on any of, any of the things I just mentioned, we'd love to hear you. Um, normally at this time, we ask for any folks that are new to this uh, meetup. Uh, you can just um, unmute yourself and just unmute your video and say hi. No pressure. Definitely see a few names. So let's see. Rajesh, Sonal, uh, Abdel, uh, if you guys want to say hi. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Abdel I'm from France. Uh, I'm interested in uh, technologies like uh, Spark, Sandra, machine learning. Uh, I'm actually an engineer, a um, data engineer. So that's why um, I'm, I am watching this, uh, uh, this talk. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your presence. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, well, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, anyone you. else? Sono or Rajesh? Okay, well, that's okay. We're not going to pressure you. Uh, good to know you guys. Um, group rules, if you have a question, uh, just ask it. Uh, maybe in the chat at first, but it's an opportunity for you to share what you know. Uh, the speaker, Nikita, may have uh, further uh, suggestions on how to work, uh, how to ask him questions, but generally it's a conversation. Uh, our company, not is uh, you know, data engineering, architecture, uh, firm. Uh, we help, you know, our biggest clients uh, build global platforms that, that impact a lot of people uh, using Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka. Uh, one of our partners is Datastax uh, and a sponsor of this group. So is George Washington University. They just graduated. They had a bunch of people. Looks like the, the rooms are going to start to open up. So we may start going back to in person uh, meetups. We have some local sponsors in DC and Chicago, as well as organizational sponsors uh, in, in for data community DC. Um, anyone looking for work who has a poor, or, or is hiring? Uh, any special meetups, classes that you want to talk about? Uh, just it's an opportunity to just talk and tell people about something new. Um, okay. 
If not, um, yeah, we're always hiring. Um, you know, full-time, part-time operators, engineers, architects. You can check us out at careers.net.us. Uh, ongoing Cassandra events um, coming up uh, next Monday is uh, Airflow and Spark. Uh, I think I have to set the topic for the next Cassandra lunch for next week. Uh, maybe I'll do Kubernetes and uh, Kate Sandra hands-on demonstration. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, Data engineers lunch uh, the following week is uh, ACA actors for data processing. And um, I, I love ACA, so I'm always looking forward to checking out and learning new things. And you can always go to anant.us slash events for upcoming events. Here. Yeah, I think all this stuff. But even from past events, we have blog posts and videos. Uh, if you go to the, um, the, the blog, um, you can always uh, find out um, everything that we recorded is on YouTube as well. You just like Google and not corporate. Um, and finally, um, if you're interested in finding resources on Cassandra, the curate, the hand curate, a knowledge base of Cassandra resources from around the world. Um, and I want to say now it's up to about 1,100 hand-picked resources, um, videos, articles, and it is searchable. So for example, look for, hmm, data modeling is always an issue. And so there's some cool uh, articles that you can find. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our presenter, Nikita. Uh, all right. Uh, is my microphone working? Do I sound fine? Yep. Right, cool. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. If I am able to do that. All right. Uh, present. Oh, okay. May have to just okay. Really? Okay, let's just do things this way for now. Or presenting doesn't work again. All right, great. <laughs> uh. Okay, so my name is Nikita. I'm a junior engineer here at Anant. And uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about machine learning with Spark and Cassandra, uh, using Spark and Cassandra for basic machine learning. Um, I'm gonna give a shout out right now uh, to um, Obi from Anant who uh, did a, uh, I believe five or six part series on uh, machine learning with Spark and Cassandra a while ago. Um, I'll be sure to link uh, at least the first video of that series that's up on YouTube. Uh, he goes into a good amount of depth on like a few different commonly used machine learning algorithms and then created some notebooks and stuff that kind of show that stuff off and it's really cool and also it's really easy to run. Um, all right. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and by the use of data, right? So it's a pretty commonly used term nowadays, whether it's becoming really, really popular. A lot of people are getting into machine learning. Um, it's seen as a part of artificial intelligence and it's used in a very large number of applications uh, in society. In many different fields. So for example, in medicine, doing all sorts, uh, all sorts of uh, drug discovery stuff. So if you have like a given like receptor you're trying to like bind molecules to, you can use machine learning to like figure out how they would bind to that receptor uh, more accurately and a lot faster than you could do with just typical like theoretical chemistry and physics modeling. So that's really cool. 
Um, it's also used in image recognition. Um, also email filtering, right? So how do you determine what is a spam email? Uh, somebody chatted something. Something wrong with screen or? Okay. Uh, I, I think it's fine. I'm able to see it okay. Yeah, maybe bandwidth issues on, on your end, Rajesh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one issue with machine learning is that uh, machine learning, at least when you're dealing with like neural networks and stuff, is very uh, complicated on the back end. And so a lot of people are very intimidated at even like looking at even like basic demos of machine learning code, thinking like, oh, I'm, you know, or, you know it's just, it's scary because there's like a lot of math going on. And if you look into any sort of like advanced course or like lecture on like YouTube, then it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but uh, nowadays there are many open source and easy to access tools for working with and using machine learning in the real world. A uh, couple examples uh, that I've at least uh, worked with before are TensorFlow, which is really, really popular. Also TensorFlow exists in a lot of different languages. So there's, I think like a TensorFlow for Java thing, uh, TensorFlow in Python, TensorFlow in a bunch of stuff. Uh, then another one that a lot of people might've heard of um, is the Spark machine learning library or Spark ML lib, uh, often uh, incorrectly called spark.ml, but the formal name is Spark ML lib. Uh, and then also there are many well-constructed resources for learning machine learning on the internet. So some of which are like paid or might cost a little bit of money. So a lot of stuff on like Coursera, like Code Academy, stuff like that. And then there are also a lot of uh, theory oriented courses and uh, lectures that have been recorded from top universities like Caltech, MIT, and often a lot of these lectures are just available completely for free on YouTube. So if you're interested in like a really good like theoretical foundation, then well, uh, I've watched some portion of this Caltech CS 156 set of lectures. Uh, so I think this one's a pretty good place to go to if you're interested in little details, although it's quite long. There's, you know, like 20 plus lectures of like an hour and a half long each. <laughs> All right, so a few neat examples of machine learning um, that you might come across if you do end up taking some of these like introductory level courses, I guess, on like Coursera or something uh, is uh, image classification. So attempting to get the system to be able to classify pictures as being part of some category. Uh, so a really common example is uh, Basically, you have a data set with a tons of or with a ton of pictures of dogs and a ton of pictures of cats. And as it turns out, with a really simple neural network and training on a good data set, you can get accuracy to like 80, 90 percent with not very much effort, which is pretty cool because like dogs and cats, they're they're different, obviously, to us, like very like apparent. But it's pretty cool how you can teach a computer that like what a dog is versus what a cat is. And you don't really, well, yeah. So uh, I'm here, I've linked a, a Kaggle competition. So Kaggle is a website for like data scientists, data engineers, I guess. And they run a bunch of different contests. Um, they're free to enter. I don't know if there are any prizes, but I know that a lot of top data science people and data engineering people like to do Kaggle competitions. And they show that off on their resumes and stuff if they like are really highly ranked in it or whatever. Um, this one was really popular, right? dogs versus cats. Um, another popular example, uh, also using image classification is determining what digit is written. So um, there's this really popular data set called the MNIST data set which has 60,000 examples as part of a training set. So 60,000 uh, like normalized, like zoomed in uh, pictures 
of a handwritten digit, so between zero and nine. And then they have 10,000 examples as part of a testing set. So that's pretty cool. And then another popular, I guess, machine learning task, which also deals with something called natural language processing is sentiment analysis. So basically you have like a tweet or a Facebook status or something along those lines. And you basically want to determine if the general sentiment of that tweet or that uh, Facebook status is positive or negative. And there's this really popular data set called Sentiment 140, which has an entire 1.6 million compiled tweets. Um, and they're rated zero to four somehow by somebody, or I would assume it's not by a person by hand, but, <laughs> but this is also a popular data set that's uh, used in introductory ML courses. This one's pretty cool to look at. And also uh, one thing I wanna point out is that uh, there are a lot of data sets available online uh, that are very, very large. So you don't have to like download a thousand pictures of dogs and cats and label them yourself and then put it all together. There are hundreds and thousands of data sets available on the internet for people to you know, use, look at. All right, so I'm gonna briefly mention uh, the four stages of processing data in machine learning whenever you're training some kind of a model. Uh, so first uh, task is the preparation of data. Um, as I was mentioning before, often this is already done for you. Uh, there are plenty of resources that have already taken a bunch of raw data, like pictures of animals or pictures of numbers or stuff like that. And they already have a, uh, like a spreadsheet or a CSV file or something that labels all of these uh, pictures. So you don't have to do that yourself. Um, and then there's the splitting of data. So effectively, when you're training a model, you give it a chunk of data to uh, kind of train on. Like you tell it, here's 10,000 pictures of dogs, here's 10,000 pictures of cats. Uh, and then based on however you set up the model, it will try and attempt to find something. There are some set of features that are interesting about the dog's pictures versus the cat's pictures. And then using that, it will try to take in future pictures and predict whether it's a picture of a dog or a cat. Um, but it's important to split your data. You don't want to train your data uh, on the same stuff that you validate with, or rather that you test with. Um, because, uh, well, part of it is that if you're only testing with data that you already used to train your model, then what was the purpose of building the model in the first place? Because you already feed it all of the data that you're supposedly testing it with, right? Um, and also if you are testing your model on uh, a bunch of data that you trained it with, then you could get very, very high uh, validation scores, which are not actually true to how good your model is. So that would be something called overfitting, which I found this little picture of here. I didn't put in the presentation, but you can find a bunch of examples of overfitting. Uh, all right. And then finally, you have some data that you didn't give your model before and you see what kind of predictions you get. And then uh, another big area that's, I guess, like discussed or that's like popular in machine learning is the concept of uh, supervised versus unsupervised learning. So previously I talked uh, about how when you're preparing your data, you usually assign labels to it. Um, but sometimes you wanna do, or you wanna use machine learning for tasks, which aren't like necessarily like image classification, right? So not determining like this is a dog or this is a cat and that's it. Sometimes you wanna use machine learning to sort of find some kind of patterns or find things that maybe people can't find or just for whatever reason, you basically uh, can use unsupervised learning methods to find patterns that, well, you don't know yet, 
that you don't know maybe exist yet, right? So supervised learning is right, training a machine learning model with a data set that has labels attached to it, like image classification. And then unsupervised learning is you're giving a machine learning uh, model, uh, you're giving it data without labels. So found these pretty cool pictures on, on uh, NVIDIA's website showing off some wonderful things that some of their machine learning uh, people have come up with, uh, with unsupervised models. See a bunch of creepy looking face pictures. <laughs> so you can see they've identified, I guess, general structure and shape of a face. You can see like the eyes and nose and stuff. <laughs> and then I don't know what the thing on the left is. But... <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about just briefly about some of the technologies used in the uh, demo project. Um, so we have Cassandra, which we're using as our database to store our data. Uh, Apache Cassandra is an open source distributed NoSQL database designed to handle large volumes of data across multiple different servers. Uh, so with relational databases, uh, typically you're stuck with uh, vertical scaling. So if, if you want to upgrade the amount of like traffic that it can handle, then you have to upgrade like processor or like memory directly, or basically you have to upgrade like the computer that it's currently being run on. Uh, but with Cassandra, because it's just a distributed non-relational database, uh, you can actually scale horizontally. So you can add just more cheap computers instead of having to upgrade your $300 processor to a $10,000 processor to double your uh, through through output yeah and then uh, a note is that the demo runs code uh, from datastax and uh, in the demo they use uh, the datastax enterprise version of cassandra which is not open source i believe and uh, spark is also run uh, with cassandra in datastax enterprise but that can be turned off or on if you just want to run dsc then we have Spark. Uh, Apache Spark is an open source unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. It provides an interface for programming entire clusters with implicit data parallelism and fault tolerance. So Spark is really, really good at working with large data sets, which is why a lot of people for machine learning or just for general data processing, data engineering tasks uh, use Spark. And also it's open source, which is cool. And then uh, in Spark, we're going to be using the Spark Machine Learning Library, or MLlib. Uh, features many common machine learning algorithms, uh, tools for modifying data and pipelines, loading saving algorithms, a bunch of different utilities, and more. And so the primary API used to be uh, based on data structure called RDD, or Resilient Distributed Dataset. Uh, but I believe since Spark 2.0, it's switched over to uh, being uh, data frame based. Uh, you, it, I believe it still works with RDDs, but uh, recent things I think are being developed uh, to work with data frames. And that's the like primary supported uh, data structure. All right. Also, we're going to be using something called Jupyter, the Jupyter project. Uh, Jupyter is an open source web application for creating and sharing documents containing code, equations, markdown text, and more. Uh, I've linked their website. Um, if you've talked to anybody that does data anything or even just like Python, Python data anything, then they've probably used Jupyter before. Um, all right, so GitHub repo, which will be demoed in this presentation, contains a bunch of different Jupyter notebooks containing sections of Python code, uh, along with little like blurbs explaining what certain sections do. Um, that's what's also cool about Jupyter Notebooks is that you can have like code, like code and markdown kind of like next to each other. And then you can run all the code, all the output, and it'll be nice and neat along with your markdown text. And Jupyter Notebooks can be used with uh, many programming languages, not just Python. I believe the name comes from uh, Julia, Python, and then R. But I think Jupyter Notebooks nowadays can work with like 40, 50 different languages. 
So that's pretty neat. All right. So this is the link to the GitHub repo here, uh, GitHub repo here. <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, this was done by some uh, data stacks people for uh, Spark Cassandra machine learning, like little course that they did uh, a while ago. Um, it's going to be using something called Docker Compose, which will let us basically run a bunch of different Docker containers that can all talk to each other at the same time with one command. Uh, the three things that are running in it are uh, DSC. Or data, stack, or data Stacks Enterprise version of Cassandra with Spark enabled. And then we have Data Stacks Studio, which we can just use to like uh, interact with our uh, Cassandra database, uh, but with like CQL queries and stuff. Uh, and also we have the Jupyter PySpark notebook, uh, Docker something. Uh, basically, it's a way to run Jupyter and PySpark, and uh, maybe it's just those two technologies, but yeah, in one Docker uh, container. So I'm going to hopefully be able to, oh man, I don't know if I can increase the size of this. Uh... I might not be able to increase text size on the terminal, so I'll try to not stay on it for too long. So we're going to do git clone. I'm going to pull the repository. And then I will also link that in the chat. Um, there is an important change that we need to do here. Um, uh, is that we need to go into the docker compose file. All right. And we need to change one line here. The one dealing with uh, PySpark submit args. Uh, the issue is that the package used here for the Spark uh, Cassandra connector is outdated. And in fact, this particular version, you can't even download anymore. Um, I think they changed like name or structure or something of wherever it was being hosted. So if we use the most recent version here, which I have linked in the presentation, but I also copy pasting from somewhere else right now. If we replace this line. So now we're using version 3.0.1 of the connector, the Spark Cassandra connector, instead of uh, 2.4.1, I believe. And this will hopefully work. So now we type docker compose up dash D. And this is going to take a couple minutes to build and run. Um, if you haven't, used uh, some of these uh, Docker uh, images, like the one for uh, Jupyter PySpark Notebook or Datastax Enterprise, then it's going to have to first download that. Uh, I've already done that. Now it just needs to build one of the images that it's going to be running. So this hopefully shouldn't take more than a minute. <laughs> Uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, in this uh, GitHub repo, um, uh, in the, I believe, Jupyter folder here, there are a few different notebooks. Um, I'm going to briefly be going over just this one right here uh, called k-means. Uh, but there are a few other notebooks that use a few other machine learning algorithms and sections of uh, Spark ML lib. So those are cool to look at. And assuming that you change this one line related to the Spark Cassandra connector, then everything should work straight out of the box. And you should just be able to click through the notebook and everything should load. 
And then again, in the future, uh, if this package ends up being unavailable or pulled from like uh, Maven repository or whatever, uh, then, well, you'll have to update this section. <laughs> taking a minute longer than I expected. <laughs> I guess this is a good time to do a uh, quick shout out to uh, Obi for some of the uh, stuff that he's done before on this. So there's a six part series of uh, Cassandra Machine Learning Spark that Anant has done a year ago. Um, Obi goes through a lot of more like in-depth stuff uh, on particular like machine learning algorithms uh, that aren't in this uh, notebook. So there's also a GitHub repository with a bunch of extra stuff, which is always cool to look at. Uh, I can link that, right. yeah. So here's like a link to the first video in the series or the second one maybe. Yeah, I think the best parts of that series are probably uh, data pre-processing and uh, model selection tests. Um, just things that aren't necessarily gone over in like general, like overviews of the machine learning process. This is taking a minute longer than it has before. Uh, but as soon, uh, it should finish in a second. Yeah, sometimes when you demo things versus run them for real, they don't work out as quickly. <laughs> and this still running thing is fine. It'll take a minute. As soon as this step finishes, everything else should finish almost instantaneously. And hopefully we can load up the notebook. <laughs> All right, cool. You can see that our three Docker uh, uh, so we can see that our three Docker um, containers have booted up, right? Uh, uh, we type Docker PS. Uh, maybe I can expand this a little bit. We can see the three containers and what images they're based on. So there's DataStacks Enterprise, uh, Cassandra, uh, there's uh, DSC server. Other, oh, this is DataStax Enterprise the server. This is the uh, DataStax Enterprise uh, Studio, which we can use to interact with that database uh, using a user interface. And then here's the uh, uh, the Jupyter uh, Docker image. So now, if we open localhost at port eight 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 eight. And we type in the password, which is data stacks, which this is all mentioned again on the small readme on the repository. Uh, again, the only thing that isn't brought up here is that you have to update the one thing in the Docker compose file. Otherwise, uh, the code will break at some point once we start trying to connect to Spark. So we're going to this notebook really quickly. Um, additionally, we have DSC Studio running. So we can open it at port 9091. Um, there are a few notebooks here, but I'm not going, you know, I'm not sure I'll just use any one of the notebooks. All right, well, we'll give this a minute to open. So uh, in this notebook, uh, we are looking at an algorithm, an ML 
uh, called K-means, which basically attempts to take a data set that is uh, unlabeled. So this would be an example of unsupervised learning, uh, I guess. And uh, it attempts to sort of group them into K data sets where you set this uh, K value. So we're gonna import a bunch of different stuff. Uh, some important stuff is pandas, which is used for like data manipulation and such. Um, and we have PySpark. And then we have a bunch of uh, like PySpark.ml uh, portions, which are gonna be using for well, the machine learning part. This is just a function to show the first five rows of a uh, Spark data frame. That's pretty useful. Uh, next, uh, once uh, the Docker Compose uh, has started, you need to make sure to wait a couple minutes. You can see we've been up for three minutes now, so that should be fine. Uh, otherwise, this line here with connect to Cassandra will not work. All right, so we didn't get an error back, so that means that we are good. Um, now we can make a key space and get a result back, meaning we're good. So we made our key space, we set the key space, and then we're gonna make a table called social media. So the data that we're looking at is included in a file called socialmedia.csv. So if we go to the repository, if we open up Jupyter and we go to data, we can see the different data sets that this uh, repo uses. Uh, this one we're gonna be looking at is social media which is basically, uh, I believe it's a bunch of different uh, Facebook, uh, probably Facebook uh, posts. Uh, they're uh, grouped into one of three categories into either video, photo, or somewhere a bit down the line. We also have some statuses. And then the numbers here are like the number of uh, likes, number of comments, a uh, number of like angry reacts and number of sad reacts and uh, some other right types of things that Facebook stores and lets you interact with content, <laughs> right? So we're gonna make this table. Then we are going to uh, load the uh, data from the uh, CSV file and put it into Cassandra. Uh, this might take a minute, but once we've done that, uh, right, so this might take a second. Um, so now that we've created a key space, we created a table and we've inserted a bunch of data, hopefully, um, we can go into uh, data stack studio real quick. Uh, we can run describe key space on the key space that we just made called accelerate. This is taking a little bit of time. All right, and here's the key space that we made. It's also showing us the table that we made. And then if we type a quick, uh, select, or if we type a quick select star from accelerate dot, what was the name of our table? Social media. We can see that hopefully we'll get a bunch of data back, which means that we successfully wrote to Cassandra. Now we have at least 5,000 results. I think the data set is like 7,500, something along those lines. So now this is the portion where if you didn't change the Docker Compose file, then this part won't work. And you'll get a variety of different errors that talk about Java or something. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see what happened.
Java gateway process exited before sending its port number. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> did not expect this. Um, we need to use a command here to try and diagnose this really quick. We can look at the logs. OK, so I seem to have messed up. When I changed this, so I just looked at the logs for um, the, do the Docker container. Um, and I seem to have messed up. And uh, after I made the changes to the Docker Compose file, I didn't press Save. So <laughs> we just tried to use this uh, old connector. Right. It says unresolved dependency, connector 2.4.0, not found. And we get a bunch of errors telling us how it tried to download it from the internet and couldn't find it. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the fix for this then is uh, uh, first we make sure that we're in the same uh, folder as the project was in. And then we type docker compose kill. So we've killed the three containers that we had running. Then we have docker compose down. Uh, then we list our docker images. Uh, all right, docker image ls. Then we need to delete this uh, uh, image that we built based on our Docker uh, compose file. So we do Docker image rm ca spark Jupyter. And then we make sure this time that we have uh, the Docker compose file saved. And then we rerun Docker compose command. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think uh, if we don't want to uh, wait for another five minutes, then maybe we could stop the demo here. But if you uh, if you correctly change this PySpark submit args uh, line with the thing that I've written in uh, the presentation, which we'll have a link to in a bit, um, then everything should work. And you won't get this Java something error, which isn't very descriptive of the actual problem, which is that it couldn't download the uh, data stacks uh, Spark uh, Cassandra connector. Uh, yeah. That's a little bit disappointing. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> You'll have to take my word for it that the demo does work if you uh, implement this small change. And then you can also use this small change, load in the uh, Jupyter notebooks that uh, Obi made a while ago, and they should run as well. So there's a lot of stuff to, to click through and to run and to uh, look at assuming you don't make the same mistake that I just did. Um, I think it might be worth it to go through the rest of the code anyway, because uh, I think what we've seen so far is uh, Spark loading the data right. from yeah. Cassandra, but we haven't actually seen uh, any of the, like, how did the machine learning, you know, how does that library work? OK, so this was the code that we were just looking at briefly. Um, right, We loaded data into uh, Cassandra. Uh, or rather, we loaded data into Cassandra right here. Then we connect to Spark uh, using this section right here, which if I didn't mess up the Docker Compose file, then that would work. Then we could look at our uh, data. 
Um, one of the things that we do early on is uh, when we look at the original data, the uh, column called social type had one of three different uh, possibilities in it, which was, one second, let's just open that up. So if we just go back to our data set, which is under Jupyter, data, and then social media. Uh, all right. So the column uh, that we have titled social type has one of three different um, things it can be. This is going really, really slowly for some reason. It's really unfortunate. Um, but it can either be a video, a photo, or a status. And so what this notebook does is, at this stage, um, we have to convert this um, to uh, a, uh, right, uh, a float type when working with k-means. And so what this uh, string indexer will do is then we can create a new data frame, which will have a new column called label, which will have ones for um, if it's a video and then a zero if it's a, uh, a status, which we can then feed into k-means. And uh, in this portion of the code, we use uh, pandas. We basically take our data frame our Spark data frame, and we convert it to a pandas uh, data structure, which then lets us easily plot it, which would give us a nice cool plot here. But, well, yeah. Um, then finally, what we also have to do is we have to take the information that we are trying to uh, feed into our ML algorithm, and we have to do something called vectorization, which is uh, basically uh, machine learning works on a lot of principles of, or a lot of machine learning is built on uh, linear algebra. And so we're basically taking all of the things that we kind of care about, all the uh, factors that we care about in our data that we want to train the data like based on, and we're putting them into like one column, one vector together. So we can feed it into our machine learning mathematical model thing. So in this case, uh, basically, uh, if we were to plot the um, on the x-axis, the number of likes versus on the y-axis, the number of comments, and then we color the points based on whether they're a video versus their status, then you'll see this thing where videos tend to get like a lot of comments, I believe, right? Yeah, so videos get less likes, but more comments, and pictures get less comments, but more likes. And so then we think, oh, okay, we have groups of stuff that we can kind of see in our plot. We can see our videos are kind of mostly up here, and then our statuses are kind of mostly down here. Uh, if we plot, uh, what is it, uh, likes on the x-axis and comments on the y-axis. And then, um, we think, oh, OK, so we have a couple different data sets. Maybe we can use k-means to see if the machine can figure out the two separate categories kind of on its own and compare those results to the actual results. So then we use k-means from pyspark.ml that we imported before. Uh, we set the k-value to 2. And then we give it some seed. Uh, this number can be anything you like. You can input a big number, a small number. It doesn't really matter. Um, but what's interesting here is that you can set the k value here even higher if you wanted to, even for a data set like this. And uh, maybe see if you can get some kind of interesting grouping based off of that. Um, I would have, oh, OK, cool. Let's see if I can very quickly uh, get this entire notebook to run. So we're going to reload this. 
we check how long our uh, containers have been up. A uh, couple minutes, All right? So uh, another cool thing with Jupyter Notebooks is that you can uh, press restart and run all. And what this will do is this will run through the entire notebook in order. And hopefully this time we won't get this error. So it's going to start running everything. Uh, as particular sections run, we'll be able to see how far we are. So right now it's re-importing the data, but it's not going to insert anything unique because we already have all the data in Cassandra. Actually, because I deleted the uh, image, it probably wasn't there anymore. But... All right. Hopefully this section does not fail this time. We seem to be getting something back. All right. So everything worked this time. So the fix that I had mentioned before does work. You just have to save the Docker Compose file. Um, again, we've added a new column with our uh, string indexer, where now we have ones for videos and zeros for photos. All right. Uh, we could see that we have 2,000 something videos and 4,000 something photos. So those are sort of the rough kind of numbers we're hopefully looking for. Uh, we can plot the data. We can see in yellow our videos and in purple our uh, pictures. So you can see in general that pictures tend to be at the bottom. Uh, so they have a lot less comments and they tend to have more likes. And then uh, videos have a bunch of comments and relatively less likes compared to pictures. And then we do our k-means stuff. We let it run. And then we look at our predictions. So we can see that with uh, k-means set to k equals 2 for our two categories that we're uh, looking at, video and photo. We have obtained 137 videos and 6,500 photos, which is not very close to this number at all. <laughs> and then if we go down here and we plot the results, we can see how k-means ended up splitting the data. Um, one uh, other thing that we don't immediately notice from the picture is that it looks like, like based on this picture, it looks like, oh, maybe a third of the data is like in yellow and then two thirds is in purple, so we're good. But as it turns out, and I'm not surprised by this, a bunch of uh, videos and statuses, I guess, that were pulled for this have a very small number of likes and comments in general. So they're all stuck in this like bottom left section. And so if we want to just for fun, we kind of scroll up here can set the k value to like, I don't know, five and see what it'll come up with. This of course won't, probably won't mean very much in relation to our data because the data we're working with only has two different things in it, All right? So we're gonna replot it and we see that it's, well, split it into five sections. <laughs> But what's interesting here, again, uh, is that we see that if the prediction was zero, then we have it in dark purple, which is this very bottom left corner. And we actually see that the bottom left corner, or this purple section, accounts for 5,800 entries out of like 6,600 entries. So yeah. Uh, and I guess that's it for the demo section of this. <laughs> Um, sorry about the issues we ran into. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions if anyone has questions and we'll be posting a blog and linking related code and fix uh, in the near future. Great. Uh, 
Uh, I guess that will be it for today's Cassandra lunch session. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully you don't make the same mistake I made. So you don't have to stare at Docker Compose for 10 minutes. And yeah. Thanks, Takita. That's happened to me before too. The whole, the save, the save gotcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone.